the bright side and pretend it's a golf score. Um, okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about LISP. For those of you planning to sleep through yet another introductory tutorial type session on LISP, you're going to be disappointed because I have only about four review slides on what LISP itself is. I'm going to actually talk mostly about um, some new technology that we've developed to make LISP, LISP easier to deploy at the sites, um, a uh, briefing on what's going on in the IETF, um, and then some probably familiar stuff about what's going on with the implementation and deployment. There's a little bit of change there. Um, the, most press, the most interesting development there, I'll, I'll give away the secret now, is that there really is work happening for, in iOS for uh, LISP uh, implementation. Um, and then I'll have the usual spec references with the slight twist and then some Q&A. So uh, as, you can, well, actually, as you can see on the title slide, this is actually the work of a bunch of different people, um, two of whom are also here. Uh, namely, Andrew Parton is here and Dave Meyer is here. I guess I was picked to come and give this presentation because of a burning desire to see Philadelphia and to visit East Coast weather where you can get a workout in and a shower all at the same time, as I discovered during the hailstorm yesterday. That was kind of fun. Um, being in Northern California, the weather is really boring in the summer, so this is actually kind of an exciting change. Um, anyway, uh, so, getting back to a little bit of history, as I said, there are going to be about four uh, briefing review slides. What provoked this whole LISP effort? Um, basically, there was a workshop held back in October of 2006, sponsored by the IAB. A bunch of people got together who were concerned about scaling of the internet, in particular scaling of the internet routing system. Um, and that's kind of what originally motivated us to put the LISP stuff together. It actually came up over during a dinner conversation that we had back in October. Um, and it's since then you know, kind of proceeded in fits and starts through various uh, working group, various IETF working groups, various operations groups, you know, the usual Nanog, Ipricot, Wright, et cetera, um, and is now actually maybe seeing some of the light of day at some point in the not too distant future. Um, again, it was motivated by a desire to scale the routing system. Um, this is a picture that everyone's probably seen a thousand times by now. Actually, brief survey, who here has seen a LISP presentation before? I expect to see just about every hand in the room go up. Okay, good. That means the review can be very short. But anyway, as I said, it was motivated originally by this graph, you know, growth of the routing state. It's up and to the right. It's obviously not linear. Um, it's somewhere between quadratic and exponential, we think, according to Jeff Houston's curve fitting. Um, and it continues to proceed despite the global economic meltdown. One of the interesting things about the pattern on this graph is that if you look at the period between 2001 and 2002, there's a clear flattening. That was the bursting of the internet bubble. We don't see a similar flattening up in the upper right-hand corner of this slide, even though the economic decline is much more pronounced than it was back then. Um, that's interesting. I don't know if it's something to be worried about or if it just reflects a, a different sort of economic slowdown that predominantly affected the internet in 102, but is affecting everything now. Um, one comment on the upper right-hand corner, you see a spike there, an apparent decline, and then a resumption of the, the curve. That's actually not a decline. That's a change in the data collection. Um, I guess Jeff lost one of his BGP feeds, so a bunch of more specific routes that were contributing to his count uh, went away. Um, the curve has continued using pretty much the same pattern. As the saying goes, I have some good news and some bad news. The good news is, um, and this is going to plug a URL that I guess is visible more on there than it is on here, um, of, a, of a slide presentation that Jeff is planning to give at some point in time that actually suggests that stability of the BGP and the global routing system has actually improved over the past year, which is something of a surprise. Um, it's, it suggests that maybe we don't have to worry quite as much about um, the rate of change causing, causing problems with CPU utilization, memory speed, et cetera. Um, as the saying goes, you know, we're not that sure of our facts, to quote Mr. Spock from a famous Star Trek episode. But uh, so you know, the bad news is the trend is still up and to the right. We're not that sure about the data. Um, multi -home, and in particular, multi-homing is still hard. And one of the nice things about LISP is it actually makes the multi-homing uh, problem easier to solve, not only for the global routing system, but also for sites. It actually gives you some traffic engineering and some other kind of site pairwise source to destination site uh, optimizations that you can do that you really can't do with the global routing system and sending more specifics. Dave, did you have a question or a comment? You look like you stood up for a second. 
No. Was it something good? Go. Okay. Um, so what is LISP? Basically, it stands for Locator ID Separation Protocol. It's a way of taking the internet address space and creating two address, two numbering spaces out of it. One is a set of, of endpoint identifiers, EIDs for short, that are assigned to hosts. They're not routed on the global routing system, so they don't contribute to the routing system growth. The other are a set of routing locators, or RLOCs, that are topologically assigned. For most practical purposes, that means provider assigned. And they're used for a global, the actual global routing system, the BGP, between providers. What that separation allows us to do is it allows a couple things. It allows, first of all, it means that we can actually use both topologically significant um, numbering for the routing system, which is the best way, in fact, the only way we know to make it scale. But we can also have topologically independent assigned numbering for the sites, which allows you to have things like provider uh, portability, avoidance of renumbering, et cetera. When we came up with LISP, there were a bunch of kind of rules that we set for ourselves. Um, not surprisingly, since most of the authors are from Cisco, it's a network-based solution rather than a host-based solution. Um, there are, we don't want, it, but that actually was more driven by the second bullet, which is we don't want to have to change the installed base of hosts. And there are a lot more hosts out there than there are core routers. And in fact, a lot more hosts than there are endpoints, end site routers. Um, no addressing changes, again, for things within a site. Minimal configuration change even to things that have to change. And it has to be incrementally deployable. Um, as Tony Lee said during, I think, an ROG meeting a couple years ago, you know, deployment wins. If you can't deploy something, there's really no point in designing it. Um, and it's address family agnostic. In other words, it works for IPv4 and IPv6 and various combinations of the above. So this slide and uh, this a little plug for Dino, um, all of the non-boring or less boring, I should say, slides that have more than just text on them are done by Dino because he's our, our graphical wizard um, in addition to being our implementer. But well, it looks like all of our animations are gone because we're using the PDF. Anyway, this is kind of a, a very brief overview of how LISP works. On the left side of the slide, you can see a source. Right side is a destination. Source wants to talk to the destination. It has an EID for a particular host within the destination, typically returned by the DNS. That's where you see the little DNS entry here. Um, it looks just like an IP address, but it's not globally routed. Um, to get from the source to the destination, since it's not globally routed, there needs to be some sort of uh, translate. It's not really a translation, it's an encapsulation that gives you a globally routable routing locator for that particular EID. Um, the way that that works is the source will send a packet, the source host sends a packet just as if it would send any other TCP open, UDP packet, whatever, to its exit router, which is an uh, ITR or ingress tunnel router. The ITR will then encapsulate it um, with an outer header that is routable and, it, and keeping the inner header that has the source EID to the destiny EID and then an outer, again, an outer header that has a source locator going to a destination locator which is globally routable. I'll talk uh, in a minute about how it finds the appropriate mapping. It then sends that packet off into the internet towards whatever the routing destination is for the destination locator in this case, uh, it, since the source is connected to provider B, it's going to send it to provider B. Provider B will, will uh, route it to provider X, since the destination RLOC is on provider X's topologically assigned network. It will get to the destination. The destination will uh, look up the appropriate uh, mapping, and then will send back the response to the source, which then can install an entry in its cache, and then can send packets from source to destination using an outer header with the source and destination locators added to the inner header that has the source and destination EIDs. That was a lot to say. Um, and hopefully you've seen this, as I said, hopefully you've seen this sort of stuff before, so this is a review. Um, if you are interested in more tutorial information, let me know. We have tons of presentations. I can point you to one of them. A um, couple things to note down at the bottom, the mapping entries have some pol simple policy that allows the, the destination to control which of its locators, in other words, which of its entry points from its providers to its site are used and for what proportion of the traffic they should be used. Um, the priorities control, which are preferred absolutely over others, where the, the weight controls whether there should be some proportional load splitting across the different locators. Along with, uh, as I said, in 
the previous slide, I would talk about how you find the appropriate ETR for a particular destination EID. Well, that's where this thing called Lisp Alt comes in. Basically, what Lisp Alt is, is it's an overlay network of, of tunnels. We spec out GRE tunnels in the in the, uh, the the RC or the draft. In fact, any tunneling technology can be used um, with BGP running over it, so that the EID prefixes are advertised on an alternate logical topology, that's what the ALT stands for, um, of these tunnels, so that something connected to the ALT virtual network can get to ETRs that are advertising the EIDs into the ALT network. By doing so, they can get a map request from the source to the destination, which then can respond on the underlying internet with the appropriate locators. A um, couple different classes of ALT devices, could be an ETR or an ITR that is connected using GOE and BGP, a map server, a map resolver, those are the new technology that we're going to talk about on the next couple slides. Or it could be just an alt router, which is basically could be an off-the-shelf Linux system, doesn't have to be a high-performance router, just running GRE and, and BGP to connect to this virtual overlay network. Here's a, again, no, gra no uh, animations. Dino's going to be very disappointed that they didn't make it. Um, but this is kind of graphically how you use ALT to find the appropriate ETR. Basically, source has, uh, the source location, the source host has a EID that it's received from the DNS. It basically sends it off again to its exit router, which is a ITR. The ITR has, uh, in the normal ALT case, the ITR has a BGP connection and a GRE connection to the virtual network. It basically just routes on the destination EID which puts the traffic onto the virtual network, route it across the virtual network to the appropriate ETR that originated an advertisement for that EID. The ETR can then look at the map request, look up the uh, locators for the particular destination, and return a map reply. A um, couple things to note. If you look in the upper right-hand corner, you can see two examples of ETRs that are advertising BGP routes into the alternate topology. Then you can see an alt router that's aggregating them. The, the idea here is that the alt topology is a virtual topology, so we can basically dictate how it's connected. Um, it's just tunnels. You can if you need to move from one point in the topology to another, you just change a tunnel. You don't have to change who you're actually connected to. So we think that the alt will be pretty well aggregated, and will, it doesn't have to be perfectly aggregated, but because we can control the topology, it can be. Um, the other thing to note is the blue line at the bottom here, that's a map request, that's the map reply that's going back under, over the underlying technology, I mean the underlying um, internet topology, um, basically from a locator to a locator, it doesn't have to go back over the alt virtual network. Only the requests go, the replies do not. So, list map server, basically it's, it's the easy way to talk to alt. Um, one of the complaints we got when we came out with the alt spec was you know, you guys are talking about doing, you know, making multi-homing easier. Um, well, one of the hardest things about doing multi-homing, at least what we've heard from enterprise sites, is doing BGP. And, you know, we've replaced regular BGP with all BGP. Well, to a lot of people, you know, that's just as difficult, as much of a pain um, as regular BGP. So what Map Server does is it actually allows you to move the BGP function into the alt routers only um, and just use analogously to map resolvers and map servers, or uh, DNS uh, servers and DNS resolvers, we have map servers and map resolvers, where basically an ITR just has to be configured to know where its map resolvers are, sends, sends the request there, the, the resolver talks to the alt, puts, it, puts the, uh, routes, it, routes the uh, map request appropriately over the alt to other alt routers, to possibly a map server that that is now advertising the EID prefix on behalf of its, um, its ETRs that also don't have to run BGP now. Um, there is a, we use a IPsec authentication header at the edge before the communication from ETR to the map server so that you don't have to have as much static configuration and there is authentication. Um, the ETR is still the source of truth for a particular uh, EID mapping. Um, it, it advertises it using this authenticated um, map, uh, map register mechanism to a map server, which then is what, what propagates it out onto the alt. Um, again, ITRs only have to know about 
appropriate map resolvers, which, by the way, can be uh, any cast, we expect, instead of having to do BGP and connect to the alt. Um, one thing to note here that you'll see in the next slide is that the ITRs actually encapsulate the map requests that they originate inside of an additional list header because the outer header needs to contain locators. In other words, the, desti the, resolver, des the resolver destination IP addresses are, are globally routable locators, while the, while the actual destination for the map request is an EID. So you need to be able to route that across possibly multiple internet hops using a globally routable locator before you can put it on the alt. Um, we expect that most map server map uh, resolver functionality will be in uh, existing alt routers, although you can certainly implement that using a separate box that implements both the map server, map resolver, and alt. Um, again, this is kind of the easy way. The other way is the hard way. The easy way, you know, contrast. Um, here's where we show uh, XTRs connecting using a map server and map resolver. On the right-hand side, we have ETRs that are connected, an ETR up in the upper right-hand corner that has registered with this alt router, which MS in it means map server. Um, the map server is now responsible for propagating that EID into the alt instead of the ETR doing it itself. And the upper left-hand side, we have an ITR needs to send a request for a particular EID prefix. Um, it's going to just send it to a nearby map resolver that it has configured. Um, the map resolver now, and, and as we see the, in the upper top row here, we show the in, extra layer of encapsulation. ITR needs this needs to look up a mapping for 240.111, creates a map request using itself as the source RLOC destination uh, EID, and then it puts an additional header on top of that so that it can route it to the map resolver, which may or may not be directly adjacent to it. And by the way, I'm going pretty quickly. All this stuff, I think, is reasonably well described in the appropriate internet drafts, which will be referenced at the end. Um, the alt, now, the map resolver, what it's going to do is it actually will strip off the outer header, um, since it, it, it is the destination. It will then take the, the original map request that was generated, forward it across the alt to a map server, um, which will then put, an put another header back on it because it needs to route to the destination um, ETR, which is not connected to the alt and therefore cannot use the EID prefixes as destinations. Then, just as with any other map request processing, the ETR um, looks up the destination EID and returns the appropriate map reply with the locators across the underlying uh, internet topology without going through the alt or through the map server or map resolver. Um, this is kind of another view of the, of the, the same example that's showing kind of the, the detail of the extra layer encapsulation. Again, the ITR wants to send a, wants to look up a particular destination 240.111. It's going to create a map request, send it to one of its map resolvers. Um, in this example, 1111 to 65.111. Again, these are globally routable, uh, regular internet IP addresses. Map resolver will take off that layer of encapsulation routed across the alt, which could be you know, any number of, of, of intermediate alt routers, the, to a map server. Map server then puts another header on it, still the same map request, but it needs to get it to the ETR, so it needs to put RLOCs on the outer header, it sends it to the ETR, the ETR then returns the appropriate reply um, directly from ETR to ITR. Um, just one quick slide again. For an ETR to advertise a particular EID prefix into the alt, since it's no longer connected to the alt, it now has to do a list map register, which has an authentication header on it, sends to one of its config, well, actually to all of its configured map servers, saying, you know, I am the source for, I'm the source of information for this particular EID prefix. Here's my art, here's my locator set. The map server then takes that and advertises it into BGP onto the alt, um, which then propagates to the other alt routers and are, is therefore available for map, for map resolvers to use. Again, both map server and map resolver are running BGP and GRE, while the ITRs and ETRs are not. Um, the trade-off here is that more work for the people administering map resolvers, map servers, and the alt, but they're being paid to do that. 
less work for the site administrators who have other jobs like running their site. Um, one thing to note is this interoperates with traditional ETRs and ITRs that are running um, alt. Um, basically, the map reserver and the map, map resolver and map server are just participating in the alt just like any other device. So as far as the other, as far as the traditional um, alt-connected ETRs and ITRs are concerned, there is no difference. Um, this is one final slide on map server that kind of shows Dino's concept of, you know, several different layers of, of, of you know, edge XTRs, kind of an intermediate layer of map servers and map resolvers to provide a, you know, a interface, a simplified interface to the alt core. Okay, switching gears a little bit. That's the new technology part of the presentation. Um, I want to talk a little bit about where LISP is going in the IETF. LISP actually has a pretty long history, pretty much almost from the beginning with the IETF. As I said, it was invented um, during a dinner conversation at the routing and addressing workshop, IEB sponsored routing and addressing workshop back in October of 2006. Um, we started then talking about it at the following uh, November 2006 IETF in San Diego. Um, we had presentations at pretty much every IETF, either in the RRG, one of the working groups, the GROW working group, internet area, routing area, et cetera, in 2007, 2008. Um, there was a experimental list spoff in Dublin back in July of 08. Um, it's not clear what the, whether this was an experiment with the BOF process or whether it was an experiment talking about lists, but it was not exactly a success. Um, there was a lot of confusion, and uh, we're not really sure what came out of it. Um, meanwhile, there's been a lot of discussion on various mailing lists, in particular the ROG list, created some list lists, um, et cetera. And we actually, there actually was a, list, a real list BOF uh, chartered at the, I, at the IETF in San Francisco back in March. And at that point, we had, you know, kind of a review of all the LISP internet drafts, discussion about whether to go forward with a working group. And as a result, a working group has been created that will meet for the first time in July um, at the Stockholm IETF. Daryl Lewis, one of the uh, LISP co-conspirators, is a co-chair. And Sam Hartman, who has a long history with the IETF, working as a co-chair in other, in other uh, aspects of the IETF process, is the other co-chair. Um, in the last month, the core list documents have all been renamed as working group documents. And there are a couple of new drafts that have come out um, independent of the core list team um, that discuss other attributes of LISP and other ways to be used, other uh, mapping data, database proposals, et cetera. Um, it's actually a pretty exciting time, and we, we, we expect some, some lively discussion at the San Francisco, at the uh, Stockholm ITF. Quick review of the implementation status. Uh, the original implementation is on, on, under Cisco NXOS, which is kind of the data center product operating system. It's originally Linux-based with a whole bunch of other stuff on top of it. Um, our test platform is a thing called, we call a titanium. It's basically a PC with a bunch of gigabit ethernets. Um, the implementation includes Lisp, all interworking, map server, map resolver, and this thing we call LIG for, you know, taking a page from the definition of ping. It's the LISP Internet Groper diagnostic tool for actually testing the mapping lookups. Um, it's, today, it's software switching only. It does support IPv4 and IPv6, um, both, I, both uh, as both the underlying and the overlaying uh, protocols in any combination. There's ET, ITR, ETR, and PTR implementations, and there's LISP NAT for IPv4 only. There is really an iOS implementation in the works. Um, I don't have any dates or train information or anything of that sort, but it is being worked on. Um, the initial target is expected to be ETR-type devices that will implement the loc ID split functionality. Um, there is some thought about doing I, uh, an XR implementation for, using, do, you, ah, for implementing traffic engineering, ITRs, and ETRs kind of within the network. Um, that talk is currently a preliminary. Um, there has been an open list implementation for FreeBSD out there for a while. Um, it's currently testing the specs and working on interoperability. Um, we've heard that someone has, has been working on a, list, a, a native Linux implementation, and uh, that's something that we'd be really interested in and would like to see more of. 
If there are any other efforts we don't know about, we'd love to hear it. Um, the pilot network, I'm going to skip right through this because I'm out of time, uses an, the titanium platform. Uh, we use a couple of different prefixes. One thing to note is the GRE tunnels that make up the alt infrastructure are using uh, 240-4. For those who say that you can't use 240-4, well, you can in some cases. Um, and we're using 32-bit ASNs to try to push the state of the art. Um, this is a kind of a map, an overview of the pilot network topology. It's about 30 or so sites. There's kind of a core that represents a geographical distribution in the middle. Um, there's the Europe region, there's an Americas region, there's a South America region, and there's an Asia Pac region with the different sites logically connected via alt to those, those core sites. Um, Deployment, we do have interworking deployed. Both, there are two, actually, actually two different mechanisms of interworking. There's one based on what we call a proxy tunnel router, which is a device that implements LISP on the inside, but also advertises coarse uh, grained uh, information of EID prefixes into the global routing system. And then there is also a LISP NAT implementation. Both of those are documented in the interworking document. We have both of them running kind of in a, in a pilot mode. And as you can see from these site, these URLs, there actually are ways to reach and use both of them. Um, as I said earlier, or as I implied earlier by all the ITF effort, um, this is something that's, that we've been trying to get out into the community since the beginning. It's an open effort. It's not a Cisco effort. Um, there's no IPR on this stuff. Um, all the documents are internet drafts. All are intended for to go through the, the standards process. And we are actively seeking other implementations and other implementers, designers, testers, et cetera. If you're interested, please let us know. Um, and if you are actually from one of the LISP beta sites and you're here, and, and I haven't met you, I would, I would actually love to meet you in person on a personal note, so please come and find me at some point. Um, here's the list of internet drafts. As you can see, the, the five core documents have all been named, renamed as working group documents. There are also a several other uh, uh, drafts that discuss implications of LISP that aren't necessarily protocol documents um, or are work in preliminary progress. Um, the documents circled in red down at the bottom are, are all either researchy documents or are things that we're not currently pursuing. Um, and that's basically um, it. Here are the references, public mailing list for the ITF uh, LISP working group. Um, there's the contact information for the core LISP team. And there's lots more information, including tutorial presentations, et cetera, at the lisp4.net and lisp6.net websites. And that's all I have. So if there are any questions or comments before we break for the break, uh, this is a good time to offer them. Don't want to keep anyone between, uh, between here and coffee and snacks. So hopefully this will be quick. Dave. Vince, uh, I just want to say that uh, um, there is a Linux implementation. It hasn't been released yet. It's been written by these guys. Roque Galliano and a few others of right. his friends um, down in Uruguay, right. and um, they expect to release that. I, I, I saw. I talked to him at the LACNIC meeting a couple weeks ago about this, and they expect to release their code this month. Okay. It's, do you know? Do you know offhand if theirs is based on OpenLisp or is it entirely independent? It's entirely independent. Okay, that's interesting. It actually runs on either Linux or NS3. Oh, cool. Oh, one, one comment, kind of referring to the last presentation. We hope that this will not be an overnight success that takes seven to ten years also. Um, I guess, Yari, I think you're next. Yeah, so Yari Arko Eriksson. So I, I, I had a little bit of additional information about the ITF stuff and then a couple of requests. So the additional information is that we've been getting a lot of um, uh, proposals in this space on the routing scalability, multi-homing, and so forth recently, and we are considering other um, approaches as well. So for the Stockholm IETF, which is coming up in a month, we actually are talking about something called a multipath TCP, which is basically something that looks like a regular TCP um, for applications, but it's actually uh, multiple TCP sessions between address pairs um, on, on the wire. And this is a slightly different trade-off uh, of, of a solution than, than less, but it basically allows you to uh, pump more data through um, than, than you would be able to do with a uh, single TCP session if, if you had multiple interfaces. Um, so that's one thing that is, is 
possibly happening. Um, and the request part is, is that if you care about this space, please come to the LISP working group, come to the uh, multipath TCP BOF, come to the RG. Um, the meetings are um, at the end of uh, July in Stockholm. Um, and also, it would be really cool if we could test some of this stuff. Um, not just LISP, but also the other things. And um, both LISP and the multipath TCP are targeting experimental specifications, which means we're not quite sure that they are ready for um, you know, real life um, wide deployment. We know that they have problems and they probably have unknown problems as well. But it would be really good to look at this stuff um, on a little smaller scale and find out you know, how well it works or doesn't work. So please consider that. Yeah, just, to, just to emphasize, LISP is certainly not the only work in this space. Um, we think it's probably the farthest along just because we've been working on it for so long. But, and, and, but there are a lot of questions that are still unanswered. And uh, the LISP working group itself has a pretty uh, restricted charter, but there will be a lot more discussion of other solutions at the next ITF. Right. Uh, there's plenty of solutions in the RRG space, but only um, two are right now being discussed in the ITF. And then we right. had the, the old uh, solution, uh, SimSex, which is a right. working group that just completed its work. Right. Uh, next, the front mic. I think you're up next. Yep. Uh, straight on from uh, NIST. Uh, Vince, can you go to slide 13, please? 13. Okay. So previously, uh, there was a lot of discussion about the first packet delay and loss. Uh, with the, I mean, with your map servers and map resolvers, uh, is there something here that that cuts down on the first packet delay, the response to the map re request? There's nothing that directly cuts down on the first packet delay. Um, we are looking, this is actually a little bit beyond the scope of this presentation, but one of the things we are looking at is me mechanisms for doing caching at the resolver, which would eliminate the delay for all of the clients of a particular resolver that need to talk to any of the sites that have been contacted by another one. And one of the things to note is that unlike like a DNS or an ARP uh, cache entry, the cache entries for the EID to our lo locator mapping are basically entire sites. So the first time that's the first time anybody behind a particular resolver contacts Google, um, you know anybody else that's using that resolver would, would not suffer the first packet delay. But no, we're not looking at doing we're not looking at holding packets or trying to propagate them. We the alt spec does talk about uh, the concept of a data probe where you can actually forward the initial packet across the alt. Um, that's something that we can certainly consider if the first packet delay is a major issue, um, but we think that that just has some really bad scalability properties. But as I said, we're looking at um, adding more caching at the edge uh, at the map resolver to deal with that. As for um, DOS attacks, well, the existence of the map resolver, uh, by in effect, protects all the alt routers from DOS attacks because since the ITRs don't have direct access to the alt routers. They don't have any routes. They're not part of the, the, uh, the uh, alternative topology. There's no real way to get the DOS packets into the alt system. Um, the other thing is that just like DNS resolvers, map resolvers can be anycast. So that gives you a way to spread out a DOS attack among multiple targets and reduce the severity of it. Um, that's a good question. It actually is something that would be worth discussing on the list mailing list. If you're doing caching, that's great. That's what I was uh, okay. trying to We're not doing it right now, but with something that is with something we're looking at. Um, the initial spec, because we're trying to keep it very simple, does not call for caching because there are some differences. In the, if, you, if you implement caching, then you have to change the request response dynamics so that the resolver, instead of simply forwarding the request, it actually has to carry state for every request so that it can receive the replies and cache them. Um, we've, we've, had, we've got some ideas on how to do that. The uh, map server, map resolver spec does allude to that, but we're not implementing that on day one because we want to experiment with small steps before we take big steps. But it's certainly on the table. Uh, back mic. Sandra Murphy, Sparta, doing business as Cobham Analytic Solutions. Sorry about that. Um, you may have heard me say words yesterday about origin authentication and BGP was an absolutely necessary and we had yep. to do it first step for everything. Yep. So slide 10, please. Um, so I see ETRs registering site EID prefixes with only a pairwise trust model and maybe having eaten the green berries on one bush and making a really bad stomachache makes me leery of 
all berries on all bushes, but that sure right. sounds like origin, authentication, validation necessary being my answer to is gonna, get another protocol. Right. My I'm, I'm more than a decade from retirement. Maybe this is just good fodder for interesting stuff to work on for Okay. But, well, you know. Let me, um, let, me ref, let me refer back actually to the original alt spec on that because basically the authentication mechanism, because we're using BGP, we basically, on the alt, the alt will be able to take advantage of whatever BGP authentication mechanism is, mechanism is created for origination at the point where a map server receives the request from a map resolver, I mean from, a, from an ETR. Um, we're not trying to solve that problem on our own because yeah. there's been tens of years of work already on things like SBGP, SOBGP, et cetera, and the whole CIDR trust model for the uh, certificate delegation, all that stuff, mm -hmm. that's all equally applicable to the alt BGP as it is to um, global BGP. Okay, so when the map server starts advertising the prefix, yep. um, they're going to be doing it in BGP announcements with the same sort of origin authentication, so the site of work applies. On the alt, correct. And, okay. and, and the, the, the authentication header between the ETR and the map server is a pairwise right. uh, thing right. that is established out of band between yeah. the administrators. Okay, thank you. Is that, good? is that your answer? Is that what you're looking for? I sure hope so. Okay, thank great. you. Uh, two more questions, and then we are way over time, so we're going to quit after that. Yes. Dave Crocker, um, given how long locator ID stuff has been chatted about uh, with a desire to pursue it, it's really nice to see this kind of progress on something pragmatic. Well, thank you. Um, it's something that's been talked about for since the 1960s, actually. Um, more recently, in about 20 years ago, when the whole IPNG effort was getting along, Noel Cap had talked about it. The people that invented IPv6 kind of totally missed the boat on this, and now we've decided that, well, this is something that's really fundamental that we have to now retrofit in, and that's what we're trying to do. But go, continue. The, yeah, v, v6 largely dodged the question of being creative with, with addressing, and, and um, the stuff back 20 years ago that was frustrating was they were, there were ideas, but there weren't details, and you can't right. really make decisions about without the details. Right. And um, one, in, one, one interesting thing to note, of course, is that one of our co-authors is yeah. Noel Chiappa, who's been a great proponent of this over the years. Did notice that. Yes. Um, in looking over some of the documents, um, they're all appropriately technical and, and focus on the how. And what uh, it, I didn't come across, and what might actually help uh, the recruitment effort and later the adoption effort, um, is something which is essentially a non-technical document that talks about value proposition and cost benefit, uh, where the cost part is designed to address people's fears. So for example, the use of DNS for lookups with packet handling was a huge fear in the discussion 20 years ago. Right. And you've overcome that, and but you're going to run into all sorts of resistance because it's a deep psychological point. Right. Um, We're already seeing that on various mailing lists. Uh, sure. Um, but but a fairly brief discussion which says here, here are the benefits being pursued and here are the costs we think we have under control. Uh, Do I detect a volunteer? Yeah, I knew you were going to say that. I would love, I, I would, uh, as, as, as I've heard said before, I would welcome suggested text. So, so and I would welcome a suggested text. So I'm document. willing to collaborate, but I don't actually know any of the details here, and so I can't say anything, but I'm certainly willing to work on it. Okay. Well, contact us uh, offline. Last question. Ron Bonica. One of the things that traditionally has made IP unicast forwarding, well, routing work so well, is that things that happen in the forwarding plane don't cause state to be created. Things that happen in the forwarding plane don't cause control state to be created. I okay. think LISP may bend that rule a little bit and that there are caches that are required that you need to be built. And when you have a cache, you have to worry about it being overrun, being attacked, all that sort of thing. Have you given thought to uh, how you deal with the problems of caching? Uh, I'm not really the right person to ask that question. But yes, we have. And Dino in particular has, because he's done all the implementation work. But there are, I mean, Certainly at the IP layer, what you said is true. There, is, there aren't dependencies for unicast. Um, but if you look at ARP, I mean, ARP by definition is state that's created on demand, and it is a cache. Well, it's so a there, is bit, a, there is a, a precedent bit, for that, that model. It's a little bit different because you only ARP your neighbor. You don't do that much ARPing because you don't have that many neighbors. Whereas I think in LISP, 
you have to create state whenever you send a packet to a new destination that may be multiple hops away. To a new destination site. Um, yes. Remember, the cache entries cover more than just individual uh, prefix, individual slash 32s. Well, that, that's um, a fairly unbounded number, isn't it, though? You know, if this were globally de deployed, there'd be lots and lots of destination sites. There, there would be on the order of 300,000 today, assuming you don't do any aggregation. Um, we believe that's a man I mean, that's clearly a manageable number in the global routing system today, and we believe that that number will be a lot smaller when, when you do reasonable aggregation of EIDs. So, yes, we are aware that caching has a long and, and uh, illustriously mixed history in, 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 in routing forwarding state. Um, a lot of that, we believe, was based on bad implementations trying to solve the wrong problem. This is a much more narrowly scoped problem that you need, that you need to cache. And the number of cache entries is much smaller, and they don't have to be requested nearly as often. Mm -hmm. So okay. I th I, we think that it's doable. I mean, one of the reasons this is an ex these are experimental RFC proposals is because there's a lot of experimentation to be done, and we, there's a lot of operational experience. We have a little bit. We have a lot more to gain. One thing that might help is if we could shed some light on what elements of caching work well and which ones don't work well, and maybe explain away the bad experience that we already have with caching. That's a good suggestion. Um, one thing I will note is that the folks down at uh, UCL in uh, Belgium actually did do a study of, you know, kind of cache dynamics and, you know, prefix prevalence and how many things a typ typical site needs to actually contact. And the number is actually much smaller than you would expect. So the cache, according to their study, the cache sizes are actually going to be much smaller than even we expect. Them to a be. security analysis would also be interesting because a cache yes. is a good thing to attack. Sure. All good suggestions. Please, uh, I, I, wel I welcome the discussion on the IETF li the, uh, list of IETF millions. And that's it. Enjoy the break.